Garrett Lisi, it's a privilege to talk to you and, and have a conversation about physics. I've been embarked on this project to describe as many ways to relate to the world and to interface with the world, and I haven't yet covered the, the granddaddy of them all, the physics uh, aspect of it. So it's great to be able to chat with you. Why don't we start with uh, the beginning and ask, what do you do? Um, uh, it depends on the day. I try not to fight the weather, so and I try to set myself up in nice places so I can enjoy things maximally. Uh, typical day, if I'm here in Maui, if the surf is good, I'm doing that in the morning. Um, if the surf isn't good, but the kite is good, then I usually work on physics in the morning and then go kiting in the afternoon. Uh, often I'll have friends visit here. Uh, also have my wonderful girlfriend here. And we usually do uh, group dinners or, um, you know, cook and have fun and then play board games afterwards, maybe watch a movie. Uh, that's a pretty typical day. So I try to uh, try to have a lot of balance in my life where I'm doing fun things and hard things uh, one after the other. Because if I just try to do hard things all the time, it gets really frustrated and I want to kill myself. And I don't want that. <laughs> And I was very intentional about the, the choice of question because I had a suspicion that you would answer with an incredibly well-rounded, balanced, uh, you know, descriptor of the set of activities that you do and not the immediate go-to, you know, I work on theoretical physics. Um, and in fact, I wanted to keep continuing along the lines of, uh, of this sort of unorthodox response asking about, okay, you work on physics and you try and surf every day and you've set yourself up in sort of the the ultimate location for that. What are some of the aspects of physics that you have a more, you know, tactile connection with through surf than through, you know, the textbooks and the, and the theories and equations? Well, I think Feynman probably touched on this best, which is a lot of people think if you're a scientist or a physicist that you're delving into the mathematical details underlying reality, and that's true. But there is this perception that looking at reality that way takes away from an appreciation for beauty in the world, right? That when you're looking at a sunset, um, to know all of this stuff about, you know, ray diffraction and atmospheric distortion that somehow takes away from it. From, but uh, Feynman said it just adds to the experience. Mm -hmm. So having a background in physics and a scientific mindset and way of looking at the world really just adds to your appreciation of nature and for your ability to enjoy it and understand it. If that makes yeah, sense. I, no, completely, completely. And, and I think, well, I come from a computer science background and AI sort of training. And so I think of it as just fundamentally multimodal, you know, reductions of an ex high dimensional experience into, you know, the most compressed state you can. And you want to sort of optimize your connection to that state. Yeah. Um, and I've, I took a roundabout approach to do it. I thought I sort of went through the, the, you know, algorithmic thinking and then sort of evolving into a realization that that wasn't enough to model the world and right. sort of then sort and then arriving at a, at a perspective similar to yours, that is like, it is the sum of the activities that, you know, that really, you know, amount to what a life is as opposed to just like the, the one, you know, the one equation that, you know, you know, you get reduced to, um, yeah, it's also and, not to get stuck in ruts, you know? So it's, if you're working on hard problems, it's easy to get stuck. And right. if you're yeah. having a varied experience that, that uh, sort of kicks you in a different state, often you can then see different approaches to the problem that you're working on. Yeah. And there's two layers to, two double taps I want to, I want to go from there because you said working on hard problems. And I think one of the problems that you work on in physics is the hardest problem. Uh, you know, the, the theory of everything, you know, the, the mathematical structure that gives rise to what we see. No, no, no you know, like it's not a, not a modest, you know. Uh, it out this way. So I'm not megalomaniacal enough to have like tackled <laughs> trying to come up with a theory of everything from scratch. I really didn't start out that way. I started out in graduate school looking at the uh, beautiful geometry of general relativity that describes gravity. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's very geometric, and I love differential geometry, the mathematics of it. It's very uh, elegant mathematics. It describes mm -hmm. our space time as this warping four dimensional fabric. Right, so this is a very mm -hmm. uh, elegant set of equations. It's a very natural geometric description of things. But then, uh, 
you know, in this four-dimensional warping space-time, we have these elementary particles whizzing about, right? Mm -hmm. Like electrons and quarks and photons and all these particles careening about. And, and, and in quantum field theory, these things are popping in and out of existence according to the quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the uh, detailed description of, say, an electron, right? Mm -hmm. It's described... Uh, you know, it's not just a, it's not actually just a point. It has properties, right? It has electric charge. Mm -hmm. um, it has a weak charge. Mm -hmm. It has, you know, which is how it interacts with the weak force and not just with the mm -hmm. with electromagnetism. Um, it also has, uh, it interacts with, with, with gravity, interacts with space time itself. Um, and it has, uh, you know, and, and it has this property called spin which is an intrinsic angular momentum. And mm -hmm. I say intrinsic because it's not actually made of other stuff that's spinning. It's angular mm -hmm. momentum that's intrinsic to the electron itself, the same way it's electric charge is intrinsic to the electron. Mm -hmm. And when you look at its mathematical description, it's not geometric the same way general relativity is geometric. It's not it's not differential geometry, it's Lie group representation theory, where in order to describe an electron, you really have to describe it sort of as this, uh, if you like, if from a computer science point of view, it's an array, or in mathematics, mm -hmm. it's a vector, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a it's sort of a four-dimensional vector that the Lie group of space-time rotations works on. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, so you're looking at this, and it's like it's sort of connected to space-time. That is mm. that is what describes general relativity, but it's a vector that's acted on by space-time in this very unusual way. Mm. So why why would nature use this weird what's called a representation space for mm. fundamental elementary particles? Okay, why? Mm. So um, it, it's as if if you're programming. It's as if, okay, I've got a float, I've got a float, I've got a float, I've got this weird array. What? <laughs> Where did this, yeah, yeah. four, where'd this weird four-dimensional complex array come from? Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't mesh with the rest of the description of gravity, which is all floats. And, and when you say the array, do you refer to the, uh, the representation of each of these quantities, charge, spin, uh, uh, weak charge and whatnot, or are you talking about the, the actual, you know, those quantities come in an array that is already packed? Um, well, if you're looking at it from a, if you're trying to look at all as, as one coherent thing, mm -hmm. then um, each time you add quantities, you ha you're looking at a bigger array. No. Yeah. Okay. So if you add, you know, if you add, uh, to, to talk about spin, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, just spin, just rotations in space that requires oh, right. a two-dimensional complex array, and that, that's that's called a poly yeah. spin. Got it. Um, and then, but for <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you like that one, right? <laughs> uh, Apple. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I I do love poly spinners, and I love drag spinners, but I didn't mm -hmm. love them when I first encountered them. Drag spinners are like poly spinners, but it also allows you to do space-time rotations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So an electron, you can't. Electron isn't just rotating; it's also traveling through space time itself, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's what, what physicists call boost. Mm -hmm. And and in special relativity, that's sort of a, a space time rotation. So it's a rotation in mm -hmm. space time, and not just in space. That that's so cool. Can I can I try and summarize what we have so far, so that people who might be listening can can keep up. So there's, there's this default methodology that we think of when we try and think of space and time. That is, we can measure things and we can zoom in on things. And so throughout the process of measurement and zooming in, we're reducing the, 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 we're reducing the space that we have to consider into smaller and smaller sub-problems. And then we can sort of decide, okay, at the limit of what we can measure in the tiniest possible ways, these are, and you know, like we we arrive at the conclusion that the atom is, you know, used to be considered the tiniest thing we could imagine. Then we found out that there's stuff that, you know, there's a cloud of electrons floating around the atom, and then there's a nucleus at the center that has, and then we zoomed in further, and then we found out that, wait a minute, maybe the things that we thought were electrons that would behave like part, like patterns of, mar 
sorry, particles of matter actually behave incredibly differently. And they're sort of like this virtual type of thing that you need pretty complex math to represent. And yes. they can be parameterized by these, these four quantities, charge, weak charge, spin, uh, boost. And those, those represent the interaction of the electron with its vicinity, I guess, like in a local yeah, like type the, of the state of an electron. The state of an electron. And there's, and, uh, yeah, and that, nothing else. I mean, if you, if you specify its position and its, uh, it, or actually you can't specify its position and its momentum at the same time. But if you specify right. an electron, its momentum uh, and its spin and it's, and it's characterized by its charge. So each particle mm -hmm. has a different set of charges. So it's, mm -hmm. it's electric charge, it's weak charge and it's strong charge. That tells you, that corresponds to what that particle is, what its type mm -hmm. is. And mm -hmm. every electron is like every other electron in, in that sense. As in, the, they can't be distinguished other than those things. And right. those the, the electrons that share those properties are indistinguishable from each other. Right. So it's not like this electron's Fred mm -hmm. and this one's Bob, right? They're totally right. interchangeable. They don't have other personalities. There's nothing more complicated going on. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, people worked on theories where that is. And maybe if you go down into you know much more detail, maybe something like that would be possible. But as far as we know, they're totally interchangeable. And then these are mm -hmm. these elementary particles are the building blocks of our universe. They're like the Legos, mm -hmm. like which our universe mm -hmm. And so, but still, this description of electrons as this matrix, uh, this column matrix that transforms a certain way mm -hmm. into rotations, it doesn't really fit in with general relativity well. Mm -hmm. Right? You can you can match them up and see how it it, it has to glue together, mm -hmm. but you are gluing it together. It's not something that's just one thing. So I had this question in my head, well, okay, well, if, if nature is just one mathematical object, right, come to life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then why spinners? Why these matrices of complex numbers that are mm -hmm. transforming this way into rotations? Why, where did these come from? And I worked, I, and I was in graduate school, uh, you know, back at the end of the last century. And this problem really bugged me. And I talked to professors about it, and it didn't seem to bug others. It's like, oh, it's a representation of a Lorentz group, doesn't have that many. Sure, it exists. And I'm like, but <laughs> it's not like anything else. Wait, These spinners are sort of yeah. in our reality. And, and, and they're weird. They're like objects that you have to rotate 720 degrees to return them to the original mm -hmm. state. Usually most objects, you spin it at 360, and it's back to where you started. But, but electrons mm -hmm. aren't like that. You have to rotate them 720 degrees to get them back where they start. This is very strange. Where could these possibly come from? And I worked on this for uh, almost a decade before I realized that exactly this spinorial structure is sitting inside what mathemat mathematicians have labeled the exceptional Lie groups, mm -hmm. um, which brings it all back to geometry. So if, you're, mm. if you look at the other forces, if you look at electromagnetism, electromagnetism the weak force, the strong force, these things are described by Lie groups twisting over space-time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the weak force is described by a, a three-dimensional Lie group, mm -hmm. right? And so you have uh, you have this uh, weak charge that particles can have, and then the strong force is described by this eight-dimensional Lie group. The, the names of these things are mm -hmm. SU two and SU three for technical reasons, mm -hmm. and uh, things like electrons and quarks. Um, uh, sort of twist around these uh, these Lie groups. Mm -hmm. They're acted on by them. Okay, so quarks have strong charge, which we call color charge. Okay. Um, I can talk about why that is and the analogy to color, but that's Marie mm. Um So anyway, but you can describe these forces that, in a way that's very consistent with general relativity. The tricky part was mm -hmm. space. Hmm. Right, so uh, so you can you can sort of unify general relativity with these other forces, um, not in a way such that they mix uh, in our space time, but in a way that like looking at it from a bigger perspective, it all looks like one big uh, bunch of differential geometry with space time and what are called mm -hmm. fiber bundles, and these fermions in a fiber bundle are just other fibers that are acted on by the Lie group fibers. Mm -hmm. 
But if you start to look at this all as one thing, it's like, wait a minute, this, it, it really looks like a coherent whole as a mathematical mm -hmm. object. And, then, and it involved a, this field called Clifford algebra, which I played with for a long time. And so you all get it all together as one big mess of Clifford algebra and then realize, wait a minute, this big bunch of Clifford algebra looks like a Lie algebra. And mm -hmm. a, a Lie algebra is a what's going on on small scales for the geometry. And the, ge the larger geometry is called a Lie group. Mm -hmm. And a Lie group is all about how these geometrical sort of rotations in different spaces uh, mix around each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to have to unpack Lie groups. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't design this universe. I just live here. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it, but anyway, uh, it was around 2006, 2000, yeah, 2006, 2007, I, was, I realized that this big bunch of algebra fit in just one exceptional Lie algebra, and that's the, the largest exceptional Lie algebra called E8. Hmm. Hmm. And, it's, uh, and also, by describing the twist this thing makes, uh, mm -hmm. around itself inside the Lie group, um, you, it makes a, a extremely pretty pattern of charges, which maps mm -hmm. the charges we know for, for elementary particles. And mm -hmm. so it's a close enough match that I'm like, oh, this is spectacular. There has to be something here that's right about this. I'm going to be working mm -hmm. on this for the rest of my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I've been doing. <laughs> no, and, and I think, well, I think it's, it's cool to have the, the story come together because Maybe we start with the fact that like I came across your work with your uh, TED talk or TEDx talk maybe 10 years ago now, and I was blown away by the power of uh, convincing, like the rhetoric power of E8 and your theory because of the visualizer and the visualizations that you built around it. Yeah. So the way I sort of coarsely summarize it for somebody who doesn't want to get into all the nitty gritties about Lie groups and whatnot is there's a higher dimensional shape that if you take a shadow of that shape and map that shadow to our four dimensions of space-time, uh, you can twist that shape such that that shadow reveals things about our universe that are consistent with the stuff that we had found before. Yeah. Uh, so, for, and and I think that's an intuitive way to get there because I think that I think you know I'm thinking about people who have limited exposure to physics and, you know, like, well, may have a high school level physics where they know all, you know, electro electromagnetism is as far as they could go. Yeah. Um, and then they, they don't get to the sort of re-renaissance of physics where, you know, it got extremely mathematical and yeah. we started sort of <clears throat> connecting these higher order mathematical structures that are essentially basically meta mathematics, right? They're, they're, you know, Lie groups operate on the space of c possible connections that result in equality or inequality between yeah. very abstract entities. And, um, and sort of like you, you get to this meta point where, uh, and I think this is where a big crisis occurred in physics, where, you know, like there was a, there was a, a falling in love, an infatuation with these, you know, connecting these mathematical structures that were beautiful inherently just in this very abstract you know, yeah. jazzy, postmodern kind of way. It can, um, take you, and it can take you away from reality if you let it. Yes. So that's, and, a, and I think this is, that, that's something that I'm very wanna, But But I want to bring back this idea. So, and I think this is almost like a parallel to the Tower of Babel, you know, uh, story in, in, in the Bible where, you know, we're building this grand project of human knowledge. And yeah. we've siloed ourselves into these, you know, little corners where, you know, you have um, people like Ed Witten who speaks in, you know, he's got access to the, the, the matrix itself. Um, and most people who have no idea what he's talking about, right? And it, whereas when you get something like the power of the visualization tool or the power of a, a, a graphical representation or, or a story or a connection to some of the mental models that most people that don't aren't, aren't in the, in the weeds. Um, I think that's where exciting stuff goes on, and I think that's where there was a resurgence in my view of of people more openly pursuing theories of everything in the past four years, maybe or since the pandemic. I want to yeah, say it does, it does and, seem like it. And you were ahead of that curve, so like I think that when you know people started looking looking back, this was something that you had already had the material for, and not only that, but the material also resonated in this very sort of primal way 
just because of the structures that you see. And I encourage everybody to go see that talk and see the visualizer because uh, you. you don't really get the sense until you start playing with it. You, the, you know, the, the, the hexagons that emerge, the beautiful, I mean, it's just gorgeous every, stuff. Every gorgeous pattern you can imagine comes out of that geometry. It's, it's pretty amazing. And is, it is almost, this is also a vague course description, but it's almost like the geometry of all possible geometries. It's like, or, or it the, is. right? Yeah. You, you, can, you, um, you, can find all the you can find the platonic solids in it. Yeah, I mean, it's all, yeah. it, a lot of it is in there. And so it's a, it's a really beautiful mathematical object. And if what I'm working on is right, then our reality, reality is basically the collection of all possible excitations of this beautiful mathematical object. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So, and, and that is a, that is a mighty thing to hold in, in, in RAM. I mean, like that is a, 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 first of all, it's an amazing discovery. And I want to get into the more miraculous aspects of your project that are, how do you get to the mapping of a visceral real world feeling to this very abstract idea? This well, is, this is true for, you know, also, I mean, uh, you know, I have to keep in mind that, uh, a lot of it is still unmatched. To what's known. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of mathematical aspects here that I'm not sure how these details work. Mm. Uh, or even if they do, it could just be wrong. It could just be a wrong guess mm -hmm. about where our universe is. Mm -hmm. Right? But, uh, you know, my, my life is my own. I can spend it uh, how I want. And I spend half of it having fun and half of it working on, on this stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, well, and, and, and I think, like, there are, there are patterns, like, you know, mental models that when you see you can sort of start projecting them into the world and using them more daily to make predictions about things i think of like uh you know the prisoner's dilemmas if is an easy one right um uh or you know and, and i think that there are shorthands that you know uh physics and math give us that all of a sudden you start to see these recursive patterns in in nature recursive patterns in uh in society even yeah um, but what what Physics is really just common sense taken to an extreme. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's like it's like all right. I mean, I'm gonna break things down into the smallest pieces, um, see how they interact, um, make a model based on how they interact, um, see mm -hmm. if that model applies to other interactions, and then if it, that does, expand it and start just apply it out to everything. If it works here, it'll mm -hmm. work there, and you just keep building up these mathematical model assumptions until you get a really big coherent picture and uh, nature as far as we can tell is entirely logically consistent mm -hmm. the only the only place we encounter paradoxes is where us humans mess with things and we're making some mistake intellectually mm. in in mm. our descriptions or understanding so there are no mm. there are no contradictions or parad or paradoxes in nature itself um, if mm. you take along just fine consistently it's got to be one consistent and the other thing is just how astoundingly accurate uh, our model, our mathematical model for reality is. I mean, you mm. can we can predict things now out to like eighteen decimal places for how particle interactions are going to happen, and see mm. that that's exactly what happens when we carry out the experiment. And that's that's astounding, you know that that mathematics itself, it, as it, as a descriptor of the universe, I mean, it's so accurate that it's it's at this point inconceivable that our universe is not inherently mathematical in nature. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. Our universe is mathematics come to life. And that's, that's sort of like, and, and the other weird thing is this goes underappreciated by the vast number of people. <laughs> yeah. The vast majority yeah. don't have a concept that they're living in a mathematical object that's vibrating around them. Yeah. <laughs> like math. Well, really it's, oh, it's going to smack you in the head. It's, it's what you're it, in. <laughs> but it's also, I think, I think it's unfortunate that we're raised with this um, sort of like zeitgeist around math education, that math belongs to a, 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 a prototypical character of person that isn't most people. Right. And I think that, you know, and, and I think that's where the unfortunate part is because math is music and everybody dances. And if you're dancing, you're literally letting math take over your body. Yeah. Uh, and and math is a cathedral and math is a good architecture and math. And, and, and then there's like, there's 
aspects of it that I do think are particularly worth noting that are the intersections of um, uh, mathematical, strictly mathematical beauty and this visceral type of beauty, you know, like the, uh, why is it that the interval of two thirds or four thirds, you know, sounds in a certain way, you know, like when, when the frequencies that are added up. Um, and I think that's where like the exciting questions about life come up. And, and I think that like being able to, you know, pursue something that lets you see that I think is incredibly valuable. And I don't think, and I think like, I just want to echo the way you frame it. That is, um, that's probably going to be one aspect of your career, but it's also going to be the other aspect of the rest of your life. Um, and, and I think it, it goes, you know, like it's kind of unfortunate that, you know, the, the um, cognitive representation of reality that we share in the zeitgeist, you know, some people may have the appropriate, you know, layers of abstraction built in, in how they reason around the world. But, but this is a difficult project. It's a difficult project even in your own head to have the layers from, you know, the electrons all the way to history. Also, every human has their own collection of biases. A hundred percent. And their own collection of experiences that led them to revalue the, the, these models, um, uh, you know, for their own particular livelihood. But it's almost as if that there's a, there's a, there's a um, mismatch between the inherent meaning of mathematics, which is just this incredibly beautiful, you know, sacred thing. It really just sh should shake everybody to their knees. Uh, and, you know, the, the connection between that and uh, the, the lifestyle, the prototypical imagined lifestyle of a mathematician, which I think is why I think the conversation with you is so interesting, because you were very adamant about saying, no, that's not how it is. Um, and well, right. I wanted to, I, I mean, we've always had this conception of mathematicians as huge nerds that have zero social skills whatsoever. And, uh, there are lots of mathematicians that are, that are like that. And me personally, I went into mathematical physics because I thought people were way too complicated to deal with and, hmm. and hmm. mathematics is much simpler for me. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're onto something. I think you're correct. <laughs> I haven't stopped thinking that, but I've gotten a little bit better at people. Um, uh -huh. but, uh, but, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, forget it. I'd much rather be reading a book or out playing in the ocean or doing something like that to interact with people. But as I've gotten older, I don't know, maybe if I'm getting dumber or something, but I like interacting with people. More. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I do think as humans, we have a, uh, we have one bias in particular that I think, uh, we are going to be, uh, very soon, um, disillusioned of, which is that we, we hold human consciousness in extremely high regard. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, we're, 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 we're basically monkeys that have evolved this uh, higher level of intelligence, but we're still animals and we, we hold ourselves much higher above other animals because of our level of uh, our intellect and our intellectual ability and, and consciousness. And I, I, this, this word consciousness is thrown around a lot as being something mm -hmm. extremely special, unique mm -hmm. to humans, um, that is, and, and some people will almost, will, some people who really follow this elevate consciousness above all else. And they say reality mm -hmm. itself is a, uh, sort of, uh, collaborative end product of our conscious functioning, our conscious minds. Mm -hmm. It's our conscious minds that are primary in our model for reality. Um, uh, I have my own biases. My own biases as our physicists are like, no. <laughs> Consciousness is just mm. not that special. We're going to see computers in our lifetimes that become mm. more intellectually capable and more conscious than humans are, the same way as we are currently to lower animals, what we call mm -hmm. lower animals. See, there's my, bi my own bias coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to no, get to I, <laughs> Well, and I think there's many reasons why I decided to sort of be more intentional about fr framing my own mental model of the world. And I think the rate of change of institutions we saw pretty solidly uh, is increasing all too fast for us to be equipped to make the best decisions given the rate of change of the world. Yeah. This is in every part, almost every slice of dimension you can take it, you know, geopolitical, macroeconomic, um, labor allocation, 
um, you know, however we want to organize ourselves. There's like the slippery slope of, and institutions can't keep up. I, I think, you know, like what's going on with academia today is, is terribly unfortunate in the sense that I, it's very similar to what happened to the Catholic Church in, you know, the 1500s, where there's an avalanche of information out now because of the internet and because of new ways of distributing information that these decentralized pods of collaboration are trying and earnest to make a progress at these, you know, big practical questions and the legacy institutions have a hard time keep, keeping up. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, the, the biggest thing we've seen for humanity is a result of this uh, spread of computers and then the internet is just the vast expansion of availability uh, of knowledge. Mm hmm. I mean, the, the fact that anybody with an internet connection in the world, which is now worldwide, can, you know, have access to Wikipedia and the rest of, you know, the knowledge on the internet. Um, and if you know where to look, you can download, you know, pretty much any book you want. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, this is just part of riding this exponential curve of an advance in computer mm -hmm. hardware and software uh, that's mm -hmm. been progressing for our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, yeah, it's changed that's everything. A perfect hook. <laughs> Sorry, so I go for it. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can keep going. So, so basically, if you look, if you just follow Moore's law, right, with computer power mm -hmm. increasing, right, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily get cheaper or more efficient, but it increases in terms of the the, the mm -hmm. computational power mm -hmm. that you can squeeze into a tight space and have access to. Uh, that has been increasing consistently exponentially now for, for several decades. And mm -hmm. if you keep going, it's going to vastly exceed human capabilities. And it's mm -hmm. going to have huge implications within our lifetimes for you know what happens in our reality. And it's taken a lot of things along with us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you know, it, all, it advances in fundamental science, uh, advances in medicine, anything you can pitch to this exponentially growing curve of computational power also mm -hmm. gets that exponential boost as a result. Everything mm -hmm. else is sort of like going along linearly. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, farming was sort of like, oh, maybe it's growing a little bit. And it's like, oh, wait, you have internet connected harvesters now doing your harvesting. It's mm -hmm. like, there's production, boom, zoom, mm -hmm. boom. Um, same thing, we're, we're seeing this in uh, solar and wind generation now. Right, where you're, you're now, thanks to uh, automation, we're able to produce uh, much cheaper solar panels, much cheaper windmills, do the installation for cheaper. And what we're seeing is like, okay, yeah, uh, maybe coal energy production is going up linearly. You know, oil production, we're trying to cut mm -hmm. it back, still sort of on this slowly, you know, slow line of increase. But then you have solar and wind, and solar and wind are exponentials. They're going like this. They're going to pass them. An exponential always passes a linear growth line at some point. Hmm. And that's coming soon. That's going to happen again within our lifetimes. So we're going to see solar wind. <laughs> no, it, it, it's absolutely cool. And there's the, the social layer too, which I'm very interested in. That is, as the use cases of AI become more personal, like the, the yeah. chat GPT case, right? Uh, we find ourselves in dialogue with these machines. And there's a reflexive component that I think is goes un, unnoticed, that is the thing that it teaches you about how your brain works when right. it doesn't react how you expect. Um, also, and I think that... Also, ChatGPT only parrots back what it's uh, been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can put that together in interesting pieces, and, I'm, and it's smart. I'd say at this point, GPT-4 is as smart as an extraordinarily knowledgeable undergrad student. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But it's not yet making pioneering advances in science, mm -hmm. right? Without without human interaction, and that's because mm -hmm. it hasn't quite caught up to us yet in terms of mm -hmm. its uh, pattern synthesizing and uh, modeling and inventing uh, new models from existing information. It can it can it can take what's known and create new mm -hmm. stuff from it. That's really cool. But it can't yet do that better than humans. But I think I think we're not that far away from what it can, which is going to be mm -hmm. like that's going to be some interesting stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, at that but, point, but I think going. Yeah. I was just saying, just back... At that point, the value of human labor is going to plummet, oh. and 
I mean, the only human labor that's still going to be valuable is like things like, you know, massages, maybe psychiatry, you know, just like human to human interactions. Humans are going to find valuable. But in terms of uh, intellectual or physical production, that's all going to shift over to uh, intelligent computers and robots. I mean, that's where things are heading. So I hope our human society can adapt quickly enough and take advantage of this rather than just suffer from it. A hundred percent. And I think just to, to tie it back to your original point, that is, I think that even in this dialogue that we have with these systems, it does humble you in, in the sense that maybe what's going on in our brains isn't as special. And, oh my gosh, how does that affect our relationship with the, you know, the other lesser animals and, Oh gosh, what do we do when we have to be number two? Uh, the only ethically pure way to live is as a vegan. Yeah. So you either have to be a vegan or you have to choose not to be ethically pure because you're you're causing right. suffering to other animals that aren't that less right. advanced than, than we are. Yeah. And uh, so like that's the only ethically pure choice. Either that or you just have to choose to be kind of a kind of an asshole and be hurting yeah. other animals. Personally, I choose to be an asshole. I like eating a good thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but I, I think that's a, that's such a valuable perspective. I think I went through the same arc. I mean, like I spent, uh, you know, I think I lasted a week being vegan and then I, you know, re- retreated to being vegetarian for about three months. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my cousin was a raw vegan and, you know, like the, the moral arguments are so sound. Yeah. And so yeah. there's, a, there's, there's no, there's just no, nothing you can do about it. Yeah. But okay, so that begs an interesting question, though. Like, if you, what do you make of the qualia nature of consciousness that seems to escape the language of um, mathematics, or, or that at least in part that we you know when reduced to a mathematical equation, yeah, our, exists our somewhere. Our high level awareness feels special. It feels and, so I don't, and I don't mean this. I don't mean to say exceptionally. I I just mean to say I, this could apply to any sentient creature, right? A dog. You could imagine what it feels like to be a dog, and you can imagine what it feels like to be a bat. Um, right. Those those types of awarenesses, right? Not not necessarily linguistic. You know, at the linguistic level, where you can sort of paint a picture of the world that reflects it back to you. Um, just the awareness itself. It, it's so strong that it feels like our conscious existence could even persist beyond the existence or functioning of our physically physical bodies. And this is an idea mm-hmm. pervasive throughout the world. I mean, the majority of people believe in some sort of um, mystical or supernatural existence that we might even persist mm-hmm. after our physical death. Mm-hmm. Whereas, Scientifically, from a perspective of breaking things up, seeing how the interactions work, um, we're scientifically we're pretty sure there's no such thing. Pretty sure mm-hmm. we absolutely require a functioning physical substrate to have consciousness and awareness at all. And without mm-hmm. the physical substrate, that consciousness and awareness is gone. It's not there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah, it's, not, I, I, it's not like it goes off to exist in some other dimension. It's just nope, you're done. I agree with that. I think that there is a, there is a, there is an embodied nature of consciousness that is almost like you need the physical to enable whatever else you're feeling, even though the the properties or the you're describing the interface at in an abstract level as opposed to the implementation. But it's almost like an abstract class, like an abstract tree, where you still need to implement the tree and you still need to instantiate it. It comes from emergence. Um, what you do is you have yeah, yeah, yeah. more and more complex, uh, interlocking, organized, uh, structurally, just uh, structures built one upon another, where you go from like mm-hmm. geometry particles to chemistry to biology to biochemistry to functioning biology to neurology to psychology, where you have just like all these built up levels until you're like a conscious being with all these emotions and thoughts and models and awareness. It's freaking amazing. And it's like, yeah, that's all built on top of like interacting elementary particles. It's like, what, how can that possibly be? But that's the way emergence works. You have these emergent layers of complexity that build up until we we have these, um, where these amazing pattern recognizing and thinking and uh, moving machines. It's amazing. But that's, uh, that's how we got here through billions of years of evolution, you know? 
<laughs> it's cool. It's so cool. It's so cool. Um, and I, I, you know, going back to our idea of the connection between the visceral experience and the and the abstract, I was I hypothesized that you were gonna say something like waves. And how, you know, like in the lessons that you find in surf, literally chasing waves and being connected to waves and under them and, you know, um, that, that there are, um, you know, those moments of connection where you all of a sudden see this process that used to be very abstract. You see it mapped out into something there, that has the power to hurt you, you know? Mathematical physics. I mean, waves are, you know, they're an incredible part of mathematical physics and how we model the world. Um, uh, ocean surface waves uh, have their their less mm, they're more departed from the mathematical ideal. Mm -hmm. For example, mathematical surface waves they, they aren't sinusoidal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They have a different shape. Um, they cluster differently. And and once ocean waves encounter uh, bottom contour, the way they you know shoal up and break and toss, mm -hmm. um, you can put it on a computer, but it's at that you know it's way far from a sine wave at that point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so the the pure mathematical description is only good to a, a you know a first approximation mm -hmm. and uh, and beyond that things get really complicated and and if you're if you're you know surfing some epic spot and you got you got a barrel thrown over your head and you're trying to navigate uh, through this wave it's you know there's there is some amazing mathematics going on there but really, you're uh, several layers up in emergent levels mm -hmm. of complexity and experience, and there's a lot going on. <laughs> that, that's uh, if you if you tried to like match it to some <laughs> mathematics, it's, it's, it's not you're going. you're not computing the Fourier transform for no. uh, for every particle in the ocean while you're surfing. Come on, man. <laughs> I, I enjoy having a natural <laughs> connection to nature, but also a very visceral connection to nature. Mm -hmm. Where um you know where you're out there throwing mm -hmm. yourself into it and being part of it, whether it's paragliding or snowboarding or surfing and just doing stuff that's fun as hell and demands your conscious attention, and you know if I if I think about math when I'm doing those things, I'm gonna get in trouble. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. World. <laughs> well, also I've been I've been going through this sort of arc where I. And I think I mentioned this briefly, but I, I approached everything with this very sort of left-brained, rationalistic, uh, you know, falsifiable approach to truth, or falsi falsifiable only approach to truth. Yeah, that, that goes great right to your argument with your girlfriend, and then you're. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's like, oh wait, winning is losing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. No, but it's true. And there are so many other centers of intelligence in the body, you know, like you have the entire, you know, catalog of cells that for some miraculous reason, identify as yourself, uh, yeah. that you could, you know, deploy in a way that is aligned with whatever objective you may have, even though the path to get there isn't necessarily intellectual, right? Like yeah. dance moves, you know, like, or, 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 uh, you know, there the, you know, it's uncountable how many how many of these there are. Yeah. But also, but also, I want I brought up waves because I think you know, as a musician, and um, I just think they're the coolest thing in the world, right? And they're you know the fact that you can build up any imaginable wave out of a sine wave that in and of itself is like is yeah. so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that the big that's a, a, a wonderful analytical tool tool for figuring out a lot of music. And, uh, and if you, if you're a musician, it, it must be a shock as a musician to look at a Fourier transform of some chord being played and like see the different frequencies all, you know, in the different plot. It's like wrap your head around that. That's gotta be kind of mind blowing the first time you see it. It's cool. <laughs> oh, and, and it, it's not only mind blowing, but it's also beautiful because you start seeing, you sort of start to translate beauty into another medium. And, uh, and, you know, it's a graphical representation, but then there's the underlying math and then the equation is pretty. And then that really gets to you because what is this thing that like, as you get more meta, uh, you know, starts revealing itself as beautiful. And I think that's also, it goes back to the idea of E8 and the beauty that, you know, once there's something hard to pin down, uh, you know, ineffable almost about trying to describe beauty, um, but that's that, true. you know, yeah. like, it's a, it operates at a high enough, high enough level of emergent complexity that uh, we don't have good ways of quantifying it at all. 
Mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 so cool, and and I think that there's there's a commendable spirit in pursuing beauty, um, and, and, and being it can be problematic. So uh, Sabina Hassenfeld has wrote, written this uh, fascinating book uh, several years ago um, about uh, has has mathematics led physics astray, mm. and the. The primary target of her criticism were uh, string theorists, but also me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like following this ideal of mathematical beauty to try to make progress in theoretical physics. But if you mm -hmm. do that without connection to reality through experiment, you're mm -hmm. running a huge risk of just being out in mathematical fantasy land rather than mm -hmm. working on mathematics related to our universe. And that's entirely possible. I mean, that, and that's. That's why I didn't go into string theory when I was a graduate student. I took mm. courses in it. And I you know, got to understand these string models of the universe. It's like, but when I learned more and more about these string models, it seemed like the only thing they couldn't reproduce is our own spectrum of element of known elementary particles. They're, they had this promise that, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll figure mm. out exactly what Calabia manifold it will be. And then all the particle properties will fall out of this. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, but we have these towers of elementary particles and not just the known ones. It's like, okay, well, you make those are high massive. You, know, you, you never see those. Those go away. It's like, and now it's like, oh, we have these super particle partners of known particles. And, they're, and everybody mm -hmm. was expecting these to show up at the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Like there was a banner set up. It's like, mm -hmm. well, we're home super particles. We're, you know, we've been waiting for you. They'd never show it up. Right? And this, is, this has been uh, just hugely disappointing to the string theory and high energy physics community in general, we were all expecting super particles to come out of the LHC and they didn't show up. And it's like, we've been working, we've been dedicating our lives to these super particle and super string models for decades. And now we have this giant collider, billions of dollars. Nope, sorry. <laughs> it's like, ah. Oh. So it's just, it's just got, this got kneecapped <laughs> at this point. And it's like, all right. Uh, maybe we'll just go into computer science and work on AI. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and I think that there's, I think of it as the second of many to come crises of um, something in the system failing in academia. Uh, you know, like in this case, it may be the hyper intellectual pursuit of these mathematical objects that map to every reality except ours. But right. there is the replication, the replication crisis in psychology, you know, like who knows what's going on in economics. And uh, so I, I can imagine a world in which these things are like, you know, they become, they reveal the lack of dynamism in the, in the current systems of um, it's scientific more, discovery. A lot of it is herd mentality. I think yeah. there's, you end up with, uh, you know, with someone who's brilliant, they build up mathematical structures. They, they go further and they see further than anybody's ever seen. They, they're, they're up here in the stratosphere into, into what they're looking at and what, what they're modeling. But, you know, the experiment hasn't caught up. Right. And it turns out when experiment caught up, the universe might have just decided to go over here. And they're, they're, what they built is a house of cards with no support. It's gone. Mm. Oh, sorry, we're in this reality. Totally different. And that's what happens if you build too high without experimental mm -hmm. verification. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm me personally, you know, I'm over here, you know, with this totally other model, not based on mm -hmm. strings, but based very firmly in geometry and, and trying to make connections to the to what we know of particle physics currently. And making if, if I if I try to build from it, I try to build in, in very conservative steps. Mm -hmm. um, but still, nature could decide it's like something different. Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever nature is, it's certainly mathematical. And we, we are fortunate enough to live at a time where we as humans, evolved monkeys, can be exploring ourselves to figure out, okay, what is the universe mathematically? Mm -hmm. I thought think about it as like, you know, I, I grew into consciousness and I realized there's an incomplete puzzle somebody left on my living room table. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, That's I, basically, yeah, yeah. I spent some of my lifetime working on this puzzle trying to figure out what it is. Um, I'm fairly good at putting the pieces together, but not ex not extremely good. Mm. Um, and but it's kind of frustrating. I might not put the whole thing together, so I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing other fun things too. Uh, but I'm always gonna come back, and I'm intrigued by this puzzle, and, and so I spend all my time on that. 
but uh, uh, I don't know, who knows, maybe I've got lucky and I've got the right picture and other people are just thinking I'm a nut. <laughs> No, but I, I think there's a meta component too that I think is like on the sort of zeitgeist of a world in which it had become taboo to try these things, yeah. you know, to ask the big questions. I think even the attempt uh, is 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 positive, and like and the fact that there is you know substance behind it, even though um, not all the piece, the pieces are are there which I'm excited to talk to you about. Like, what are some of the missing pieces that you, you know, that you're actually like, ooh, about in, in E8? Um, there are a lot of good things about it and a lot of things that I'm still not sure exactly how they work right. So mm. at this point, after working with it for so long, I have a very mm. good understanding of how uh, the symmetry of triality works within mm. the groups. And, uh, and, uh, triality is very important because one of the first things we saw as we built larger and larger particle accelerators is that the known the known particles that make up stuff like atoms, right, which are mm -hmm. protons, neutrons, and those are both made of quarks, which we first figured out in the 60s, um, orbited by electrons, and, and when those interact, they can spit out neutrinos. Mm -hmm. Right, so you've got, you've got neutrinos, electrons, you've got up and down quarks, and those up and down quarks come with, you know, Basically, uh, there are three fundamental types corresponding to different colors of the strong force. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got that collection of fermions, and we call that one generation. And what they found in particle accelerators are, are there are two other identical copies. Mm -hmm. So an electron has a, a more massive partner called a muon, and a more massive particle still called the tau. Mm hmm. Right? And similarly, you know, the, the up and down quarks have higher massive copies. And so there are actually three copies of things in nature. And that's why this triality symmetry that exists in E8 is so mm. fascinating, is because it gives you three copies of things. Mm. Three copies of, of, of spares. Yeah, that's so, huge. Yeah, yeah. So this is this this was mind blowing that's huge. In, in 2006, 2007. It's like, oh my gosh, you get three generations of fermions. And, and fit them all very compactly in this E8 Lee group, it's, it has, a, it has a, a, some very nice properties that way. But there's some things that are weird about it. The, the, the two main things that are weird about it, um, which is what I'm currently working on, are uh, quantum mechanics is not incorporated within E8. You can mm -hmm. take an, 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 a geometric model based on E8 and do quantum field theory with it and like do quantization the way you normally do quantization with a, a, a classical field theory, right? Mm -hmm. so there, there's, there's nothing saying you can't do that. That works fine, but it doesn't tell you where quantum mechanics itself comes from. Hmm. 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 What I'm working with, with this part with this paper that I've been working on for way too long now is, uh, I have, I think found, a geometric object larger that, than E8 that, that, in, that in, incorporates it, that mm. also naturally geometrically includes uh, quantum mechanics. Mm. Okay, and this is very important because if the universe is just one mathematical object, it has to be a mathematical mm. object that somehow also describes quantum mechanics. Yeah. The universe is fundamentally quantum mechanical. And if it's going to do that, right, if you're going to describe quantum field theory, you can have, say, an arbitrary number of photons stacked on top of each other. We usually we, we do that with laser beams, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a lot of identical photons in the same state going with the same momentum, right? Mm -hmm. You get a laser beam, and so so to have an arbitrary number of uh, particles in any one state, you need an infinite dimensional algebra because uh, a state mm -hmm. you're, so is you're state. integrating so, to infinity. Yeah, so it has to be infinite dimensional. And, and E8 mm -hmm. is a finite dimensional object. Mm -hmm. But it turns out there are these infinite dimensional Lie groups that are uh, mm -hmm. hard to work with, and mathematicians themselves are just, you know, still wrapping the, their brains around how to work with these things. But there's a lot that's been built up about them and how they work. And this is what we're going to have to go to if we're going to have a geometric description mm -hmm. of the field theory itself. And so this is what I've been working with for the, for the you know, past decade. Is how to how how do these infinite dimensional Lie groups work in conjunction with E8 uh, to give uh, quantum field theory itself as a unified geometric model for reality? 
I see. So so let me try and, and regurgitate it back to you to see if I got it. So there so quantum mechanics doesn't doesn't exist within E8. So in the shadow that E8 projects, we get relativity and sort of like the classical universe that we know. Um, but we don't have the stuff that operates at the very close to at most you can get one photon. But right. I see, I see. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Um and then, uh, and, and yeah, and quantum mechanics is the the sort of the set of rules that guides how mostly light, but a lot of other uh, uh, everything. Uh, yeah, everything. I guess like everything <laughs> that's electromagnetic. Um, th yeah, which is which is crazy. I mean, and I think that's worth exploring more because I think that there's something I found this fault line sort of in the world that is that in any attempt to try and describe it. You can build up one side of the picture and it's missing just one thing. And then so you build the other side and you make it incredibly robust and, it, you know, and it fails at this one thing. Yeah. And I think that's what happened at the, you know, in the heyday, you know, like the, the, the when quantum mechanics was being blown up is that there is this very valid sort of from the ground up alternative to describe the set of phenomena that was outside of the purview of some of the frame, the reigning framework. Yeah. But when you build these two towers, they're, you know, they don't want to shake hands. Right. And I think there's something almost, almost transcendental about that, where, where we, we can't find where the flaw is and we can't find the unifying math for it. And so, okay, so then <clears throat> we take a detour from, you know, the physical world that we try to explain with math and we sort of have these conflicting descriptions of. And we advance in math. We keep advancing in math and keep discovering these sort of higher and higher order maths, including like uh, group, group theory and uh, Lie groups. <clears throat> and like basically the way symmetry interacts with itself, uh, yes. which is which is the trippiest thing you could ever think about. And, like, <laughs> and we people find... LSD. I don't touch that stuff, but <laughs> apparently when you're an acid, this uh, stuff like, comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, if there's any, any of our listeners want to describe it, you know. Oh, um, no, no, don't email me about it, please. <laughs> I can't do it with you. Don't need to know about your astrotrip, thanks. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> the uh, No, but, but there's, so the study of symmetry reveals the asymmetries in our descriptors of the world. And so, but then I hadn't gotten to the point where, uh, you know, Lie groups can be infinite dimensional. And... So then, then that is as close to the boundary as my brain gets with my model of the world we're, currently today. We're all at the, the boundary of known mathematics at that point. I mean, mathematics is it's like, you know, when you're talking about infinite dimensional representation theory, mathematics is still working that out. There's a lot of things being pushed forward uh, in real time in that research. What were some of the... Um, what were some of the... the um, counterintuitive uh, intuitions that you had to develop in going from a finite dimensional object to an infinite dimensional object? Um, there's so many. There's, there's, uh, the simplest one is probably uh, comes from so when you're, when you're dealing with representation theory of finite groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can have, how do I describe this? Um, when you're looking at how directions twist around each other, mm -hmm. okay, most of the time, uh, inside the group itself, you have a circle. Yeah. Right? So you, it's like, you, and, and uh, mathematicians, you call this a torus. Mm -hmm. right? And other directions uh, can wind around this torus. Mm -hmm. right? And that twist number is what we, we call our charges, what physicists call charges. Mm -hmm. so a, a quark, say, will have an electric charge of, of a third, right? That's a one mm -hmm. complete twist around the circle that corresponds to electromagnetism within a Lie group, right? Mm -hmm. And a electron will have maybe three twists corresponding to an electric charge of minus one in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is you, so beautiful, by the way. I mean, just the fact that we were able to represent all this stuff in in is and... like the number, the, like a one third here and a minus one over here, and that's it's just a lot of one dimensional one. But yeah. and then uh, inside E eight, you have an eight dimensional maximal tor maximal torus. So you have eight of these different types of charges for how things can wrap around. 
But in space-time, okay, you don't have a, a circle. Um, you have a hyperbola, right? Hmm. And the reason you have a hyperbola is um, something can get arbitrarily close to the speed of light. Hmm. So um, this is instead of a rotation, this is called a boost. Okay. Okay, and there's no limit um, to how close you can get to the speed of light. You can't get to it, but you can mm -hmm. keep, keep applying more and more boost, uh, which is also called rapidity. Mm -hmm. Okay, to get faster and faster the speed of light for an elementary particle, and this this changes things for an elementary particle. It, it um, and you have time dilation. You have you have fun stuff mm -hmm. that happens when you do this. The physics is great. It's mm -hmm. It's really, as things go fast. Um, but when you look, uh, and, and so uh, as, a, as a result, you don't have a finite number of twists around a hyperbola, mm. right? You have more like the, the rate at which things are increasing. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So you don't necessarily have quantization in the same way. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right? So, uh, so things get interesting when you incorporate time. And that's mm. the, other, the other weird thing is how do you incorporate time so it's that time isn't circular, right? So time is actually, you know, mm. it's as it's hyperbolic. And, uh, and what we say is that, you know, if something, if something is winding in, in, a, in a circle, you'd say that it's, it's eigenvalue, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. multiplier is imaginary. So I, mm. I don't know if you've seen this thing where, like, uh, if you raise... Uh, if you have an exponential to an imaginary quantity, you get weight. Mm -hmm. Have you seen mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Okay. And if you have an exponential to a real quantity, you get a rising exponential. Mm -hmm. All right. I see. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So these correspond to, in, in quantum mechanics, uh, due to, uh, I think his name was Charles Hermit or something. Anyway, the, the algebraicists who first worked this out, uh, the, they're called, uh, the first one with, Imaginary eigenvalues used is called anti-hermitian. Mm -hmm. And the one with real eigenvalues is called hermitian. Right? We get raising mm -hmm. And and uh, if you deal with finite Lie groups, the eigenvalues for um, for compact circular maximal torus are always imaginary. Mm -hmm. um, always imaginary. Corresponding to um, uh, anti-hermitian uh, operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you have an exponential, the the eigenvalues are always real, and corresponding to uh, hermitian operators. Um, but in quantum mechanics, uh, we have what's called unitary evolution, and unitary evolution corresponds only to anti-hermitian operators. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason you have to have unitary evolution is because if you don't have unitary evolution, your probabilities in quantum mechanics sum to more or less than one. Whereas mm. in quantum mechanics, you want to constrain things. So that the, the, the probability, you don't have weird skyrocketing property probabilities or vanishing probabilities. The probability of, of something happening in total has to be one. Right. That's a, that's a postulate of quantum mechanics. You, you, always, you always have to have probabilities that add to one. It's like I, 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 you flip a coin. It's like you can't have sixty percent tails and fifty percent heads, right? Mm -hmm. it, has, it has to add to one. You get a forty-five, sixty mm -hmm. for your odds if you have a, a wonky mm -hmm. board. It, it, it can't be more than one. So, it, it, so that 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 demands what's called unitary evolution. Now mm -hmm. that that correlation between compactness and non-compactness, anti-hermitian, hermitian, um, unitary, non-unitary. That, that stack holds consistently for finite Lie groups. Mm -hmm. You go to infinite dimensional representation spaces, that's out the window. You can have unitary evolution of non-compact uh, exponentially increasing. Mm. And, and that's like, ow, what? Really? Oh, no. <laughs> that's... <yeah. laughs> <laughs> Well, it's almost as if here's here's my sort of read on it is every time you you get to the point where there is a a coincidence of polar opposites that land in the same slot 
you know, right. and you create a, a generalized framework to incorporate for the case in which it's one and the case in which it's zero, you find yourself doubling the, co- the, the intellectual apparatus you need right. for one case versus the other. And then you do the same and build the tower up and then, you know, eventually, and this feels like, you know, like, okay, the, the cognitive leap to, to go from this model of reality that we exist as an instance of, um, you know, to actually find out what goes on at the tiniest possible levels, you need to also build the apparatus for, um, th- for you know, or double the apparatus because you now it's a, akin to building, you know, ternary logic or something where now you need to add, you know, a third value for everything. Yeah. So this, this problem, this probably impossibly for me hard problem that I'm working on, which is how to incorporate and describe quantum mechanics geometrically in a way consistent with our geometric understanding of general relativity uh, and quantum field theory um, is probably the last thing humans might be able to do before machines do it and might not tell us. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> well, that's motivation. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm taking a shot at it, but my, my main competition is machines. I think they might not. Yeah. I think they might figure it out and then not tell us. But, and, and my approach might be wrong. So the, the my personal use of infinite dimensional Lie groups and this paper I'm working on that's going to describe you know how that matches to quantum field theory, I might just be off. I might have it wrong. I'm looking forward to putting this paper out. I certainly hope to do it within this year. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're going to have too long. Um, but there's... Uh, the the way I'm the picture I'm putting together I, I hope presents it in a way that is uh, understandable and takes a good first shot at it because mm-hmm. string theorists haven't even tried. I mean they've What's they've, that they've, about? Maybe, they've maybe played with a couple of the pieces of it, but they haven't they haven't seen it the way I'm looking at it. Um, uh, everybody uh, who who does quantum field theory basically you take a classical field theory and you apply quantization to it and this has been done for uh, about a century now hmm. and there's no but once again if you look at the picture that the universe is just one mathematical thing um my bet is that it's a excitations of an infinite dimensional Lie group hmm. big question as to which one <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> how question, many how, of those are there? Or how the, big is the... the world of time works in it. Another question is still the, the quantum measurement problem. You know, why... The, I mean, the most elegant description of quantum mechanics is the many worlds interpretation where we all, you have all these quantum realities branching out continuously as an infinite tree. Um, but we only perceive one. We, we are, we're in this one. What's that mean? We're just mm-hmm. in this one. Well, we're in the other ones too. But why does it feel like we're just in one? You, know, it's, mm-hmm. you, you do the math, and it's like, yeah, you should feel like you're just in one. This one over here also feels like they're just in one. But it just, it's still, it's like our consciousness, that consciousness thing all over again. It feels like yep. one's special. Yep. Right? But why is one special? I think there's there's something, I don't know. I I, I, I like it when the, the layers stack and like are poetic about them. But I think that the pursuit of understanding the map and I think like the, the map of all possible timelines and the map of all possible futures and the map of all possible human interactions and physical configurations of the universe. If we understand the map, then we can orient. Well, we have an intuitive sense of the orientation we have in the map, even though our map is, you know, incomplete now. But I think there's something cool about saying that, like, OK, the more accurate the map, the better our orientation will be and the better our alignment with <clears throat> the, you know, whatever possible world. However, you choose to interpret the the the. However, you choose to take the interpretation, you're still navigating to it either by whatever technological discovery you make or by just going there. You know, you're that's where you're trying to go is the best possible world, yeah. um, and and I think you know, the, and I think that the spirit of of the types of research that you that you do and the way that you communicate are very inspiring and the. You know, I was very, I'm very grateful for the uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today and just geek out about this stuff, because I also know like that there is a there is a labor of love to be done in terms of translating the jewels at the top of all these uh, fields that we have in physics, in math, in computer science, and translating them into a narrative, more colloquial uh, set of talks and and, and right. implications. Yeah, I think so that, are largely the wrong vehicle for this. 
The what? I think words are the wrong vehicle for this. I think words are the wrong way to describe reality. I think words are great for describing human interactions, human relations, human contracts. Great words, awesome. But it's really, our universe is not built out of words. Our physical universe is built out of mathematics and humans, including me, are crap at mathematics. <laughs> we don't, we don't, you know, talk, I, we don't talk in equations. <laughs> I would, I would, maybe that's where I push back a little. I think, I think you're right, but I also take the more general approach to a word where, you know, I think of a math, mathematical expression as a word, you know, right. the more sort of like, simple manipulation. Uh, yeah, you, you mathematics sim- is sort of simple manipulation to a, to a degree. You can only get so far. I mean, we don't. You don't usually think about it. You know, like when you're doing advanced mathematics, you, you don't think about pushing the equations around. You get a piece of paper, and then you do push the, the symbols around, and that's uh, you can you can get places that way. But that's not usually how you think inside. It's really hard to describe. No, it's very my I, my humble theory is that there the exercise of identifying the connection between a symbol and its meaning is where the magic happens. Yeah. And, um, and I think that in the process of narratives, I think, you know, storytelling and whatnot, your brain gets hijacked into the state of this sort of like very malleable software uh, that can all of a sudden absorb concepts in, in multiple different dimensions uh, that, you know, maybe less truthful, but are better at compressing the higher dimensional aspects of yeah. a given thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> even though I agree... This is the best way to understand it. Oh, sorry, what was that? Uh, different layers of abstraction is a, is a good way yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that you're right. I don't think the building blocks of the universe is words by any means. And that's, um, that's where these LLMs are operating currently, but they're going to build up with yeah. other layers of abstraction and structures yeah. and things. And so I think they'll, I think just building up with more computational power and different models and uh, maybe link them up to, you know, to Mathematica and so they, they have words and logic and yeah. mathematical manipulations and stuff. Um, they're, they're getting there fast. It's, it's kind of scary. Fast. So fast. Terrifying. <laughs> uh, or, but in, in, and things like uh, like they will be able to develop an intuition for the measurement of certain things, right? They'll they'll connect to all the you know, LHC will all the sensors in the LHC will be directly connected to this thing, and so right. it'll feel the experiments as if they're thoughts in its mind, uh, right. and I don't know. It's exciting and terrifying, but I think that the process of trying to. Um, uh, I think that the project of trying to synthesize as much knowledge as we can and keep it in 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 a in an as effective as possible mental model yeah. is the only thing we can do to um, to uh, adapt to that mental model as things change over the next ten years or so. Yeah, and I was I was actually really happy that uh, when I found that these weight diagrams, you know, the pretty root diagrams mm-hmm. of E and the particle charges and interacting and projecting it down from eight dimensions down to two. I was very happy to find out how pretty that was. Because it's like, it's so oh, beautiful. Yeah, this is because this is an exit for a very pretty description. A very, and it's a, it's a, I also like descriptions that don't lie, that don't cheat. Hmm. So when you, when you, when you take these elementary particle weights and you project them down to two dimensions to make patterns of interactions, they preserve the conservation of these charges in, in two dimensions mm. as well. So you're, it's an honest portrayal of the charges uh, and, and of these mathematical objects. And in fact, if you have a, if you have a pattern, if you have a weight diagram of, of a Lie algebra, you can, you can reproduce the Lie algebra from the weight diagram and from the Lie mm. algebra group. So it, it, these weight diagrams, not only do they describe the physics, they're an honest description. And you don't get that with, with string theory. You don't get that with, with, um, with most other mathematical physics. So usually there are cheats that are involved. And whenever you, do a, whenever you show a picture that corresponds to some advanced physics, usually there's some cheats involved to simplify it. And then you show a sort of analogous representative thing. Yeah, a string is sort of like an oscillating violin string. Sure. Um, but for these weight diagrams, it's like, no, these are the... These are the values of the weights or these particles that come from this pattern. It's an, an, a completely honest depiction. 
I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was happy to see that. And I'm, I'm also happy that these things have worked their way into Wikipedia now. Or now you see the weight diagram mm. for, for unified models and for the standard model. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm happy if I had a part of, uh, of helping that happen. Um, uh, socially, it's all a mess, but you know, it's fun for me to play with when you're on, on Maui on this island where I get to work in blissful isolation most of the time. It's great. <laughs> What do you what do you make of the fact that your theory has had a way farther reach than uh, most? I would say classical, you know, people. I, I would say E eight has a far broader reach than uh, I don't even know what's going on in like uh, universities. Um, well, what's going on in universities in high energy theory is um, pretty much despair in terms of mm. particle physics. And it's either despair or, or delusion, mm. right? If you're a strength theorist right now, either you're in a state of despair or you're in a state of delusion or you switch to something else. Okay. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. The ones that are in a state of delusion. That are, bad. Yeah. Strength theory. It's going great. You know, higher and higher particle accelerators. We'll see the strings at higher energies. We'll see the super particles, you know, it's going to happen. You know, probably after I die, but yeah, it'll happen. Um, these things are just delayed. I, I, I have a check from a, a Nobel laureate that uh, where he lost a bet about super particles being seen at the LHC, and it says uh, supersymmetry delayed. So here's your check. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh no! So 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 yeah, there's there's delusion, and then there's despair. And the despair was, I built my career on these super particles being seen. Yeah. Didn't see them. And then there's adaption, but, you know, mm. adaptability. Okay, I'm going to move away from strings. I'm going to work on scattering amplitudes, which don't have to do with strings. I'm going to work on other models that don't have to do with strings. I'm going to go into AI or get a lot more money, you know. Great, do that. Mm. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's those three things going on. Um, and then there's this weird guy on an island working on his own, you know, his own theory of everything, like lunatic, uh, that very few other physicists pay attention to. It got so you ask me how I feel about the the reach that it got. Um, this EA proposal, I mean, when I was writing this thing, it's like, okay, here's a here's a paper for a proposal for an observation about particles and how they fit in E8 and can, and generations can be connected by triality. Um, I'm going to put this paper out and say, like, uh, someone at a conference sees I'm working on this and they stick to a popular science writer on me to write a description mm -hmm. of the theory. And that came out in 2007 or so. Um, and, uh, and I said, oh, great. My parents will look at this and they'll, they'll be able to see at a popular level sort of what I'm working on. Great. I'm glad this popular description is getting made. Um, and then this guy from the Telegraph says, wait, he's a surfer? <laughs> mm. So then it's like, Surfer makes theory of everything that goes around the world press and, 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 and strength theorists lose their shit. It's like, why is this guy with like sort of a quaint theory that came from theories from the eighties, uh, uh, getting all this attention he doesn't deserve. We got to shut this guy down. So the, the boot came down on me, uh, as far as spreading this, this idea to other physicists. And said, no, this theory is wrong. It can't work for this reason, this reason, this reason. I'm like, well, those are things you, you've worked out stranger stuff than that. You know, there's much stranger things oh, than yeah. the mirror, mirror fermions and string theory that have been dealt with by them getting larger masses, like the whole tower of states and different, you know, the fact that they can't get the standard model out of it in any easy way at all. I and mean, they're, they're much harder things that have been worked on compared to the problems with e, that E8 has currently. Um, but anyway, it, it, it got clamped down. But, you know, I'm okay with that. I'm okay being this weirdo on this island working on this amazing, you know, toy chest that I opened up, uh, more or less on my own, um, and working things out. And, you know, I'll put this paper out and maybe people will read it. They'll draw what they want from it and move on from there. Um, the popular attention was weird. You know, going to TED, that was awesome. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got invited to make a really, really bad TV show. Uh, to do with inventions for the History Channel. Okay, whatever. Um, I did that for one season, then I split off for Indonesia to surf instead because uh, they couldn't pay me enough money to do that again. Um, uh, so, yeah, but, but my, my life's been pretty good. 
Uh, also, mm-hmm. I, I got grants at one point and invested that in stocks and Bitcoin. So financially, I'm doing great. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I like my life. I like working on this as sort of my own personal project. Um, there's another group of people um, working with division algebras, which are uh, intrinsic to uh, the exceptional Lie groups. And those people are sort of advancing the use of like octonions and quaternions in, uh, in particle <laughs> physics. And I think that's great. Um, I've, I've you know, been to conferences with those people, but not recently, not since before the pandemic. So, and I know that making advances at some point, they're going to, they're going to get up to like, uh, they got to get up to exceptional Lie algebras mm. because exceptional Lie algebras have pretty much everything they're looking for along the path. Mm. There. So they'll get there. Um, at some point they might pass me. I don't know. I'll get older. Mm. At some point. I'm not now. I'm still 24. You know? like, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, day past 23. <laughs> Um, no, no, no. I, I think it's it's awesome. I think there's a reflection of of how the pursuit and spread of information actually goes on in the world that is very present in your case. That I think it's worth highlighting, um, and it's all it's a, just a good thing to know for people that you know, like if an institution gets. Um, taken over by some kind of herd mentality. And I'm not saying one particular institution. I'm saying the institution of, of, of theoretical physics, um, where, you know, through years of, you know, positions not growing, maybe some positions closing, and, you know, creating a space of uh, intellectual vulnerability and imposter syndrome and, uh, you know, yes, sir, to the invisible sir that is, you know, you know going on. Also, there's also a hero worship. There's also there is like, hero worship. people look, look up to people who have very uh, established, excellent reputations. And those established, excellent reputations uh, uh, absolutely are probably deserved in terms of skill, mathematical ability, mm-hmm. everything. That doesn't mean they didn't take a wrong turn decades ago. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Wow. Um, all right. Garrett, thank you so much for your time. This is, this is invaluable <laughs> to me. I really appreciate it. Um, I am excited to see the paper when it comes out. I, I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited to dive deep into it. I feel like I've been slowly coloring the edges of my mathematical understanding. It gets a little fuzzier toward the the Lie groups and the implications thereof, and the fiber bundles and the twists. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited to to do even more research and have a maybe a more in depth uh, conversation sometime in the future. Um, or about anything else, really. Yeah, Christian, it's been really good talking with you. Thanks for inviting me to do this uh, podcast with you. You got it. See you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.